We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall fight on the beaches. The new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. The first few minutes of Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk are devoted to introducing the exhaustion and desperation that the Allied soldiers had to fight through during this historical event. There really isn't any gory or ultra-violent imagery like Saving Private Ryan's Omaha Beach scene, but it's more about the psychological trauma that these people are experiencing. I'm not going back. Perhaps this is the main reason why Christopher Nolan said, I really chose to view this not as a war film, I chose to view it as a suspense thriller. The fear and desperation to get out of this place is what's contagious about the film. But Dunkirk never shies away from showing us the reality of war, which is that people die, and often not in the heroic way Hollywood may have led some of us to believe. This is one of the main lessons the film teaches us. But let's explore exactly what makes Dunkirk different, and what we can learn about war, and most importantly, about ourselves. As the film progresses, something becomes apparent. We don't know any of these people. What's your name? Maybe you can faintly remember a name or two, but you can't tell where this person's from, if he's married, or what he did before the war. While many war movies have that one scene where the characters talk about their past experiences, we get none of that in Dunkirk. Here, the characters have no backstory, and in some cases, they don't even get a name. A character is a soldier, and that's all there is to it. Just a person trying to survive. Which is why we follow this guy for the majority of the movie. Okay. Because he was lucky. Because he survived. He isn't special in any way that we know of. But the life or death mentality of these young soldiers is more than enough. No one expects them to do anything but survive. They already did more than most would even dare to think about. Check fuel, Fortis wanted to. Nolan wanted to subvert Hollywood's established ideals of what a war movie should be and let go of the former heroic depictions of war in film. Spielberg already did this in Saving Private Ryan, where he successfully illustrated the horrors of war by placing the viewer in the middle of the action. But Nolan treats the camera as an omnipresent point of view, closer to a third-person perspective where the distinction between viewer and action isn't as blurred. But he uses other techniques to raise tension and make us feel in the middle of this chaos. One of those techniques is Hans Zimmer's score. Instead of going with a more conventional approach to the score, as he has done in the past in other Nolan movies, Zimmer gives it a nice twist. He has achieved something great here, where the music adds so much tension and feeling to every scene while remaining almost non-melodical. It's more sound design than anything, but acts as a perfect companion to the film. What is the bloody air force? His soundtrack begins by a ticking that gives way to his score that seems to be constantly rising. Adding to the realism of the film, Nolan is known for minimizing the amount of CGI in his movies as much as possible. He even decided to use cardboard cutouts instead of CGI to show how many soldiers there were. So naturally, he decided to use real planes and boats. They spent $5 million on vintage Nazi aircraft that were destroyed during the shoot. They also brought in some warships and renovated them. He even went as far as shooting the movie on location at the beaches of Dunkirk. So even though the filmmakers definitely put in the work to immerse you in the moment, some felt the movie was inferior to Nolan's other films because of the lack of characterization. But we think people are missing what Dunkirk is all about. It's about this moment, here and now. It's inescapable, because the film is essentially a gigantic battle sequence. We're more than happy to make the argument that the rather simplistic approach to characterization doesn't detract from the film, but adds to it. Tell me! Because the film is about the spectacle, about this event. The care we have for these people's survival 
comes from being in the middle of this moment and identifying with them because they're human, not from the backstory or even actions of their characters. And granted, the structure of the film would feel like a gimmick if it wasn't so cleverly executed. The three interconnected stories, air, land, and sea, range in scale and length, but they all meet at the same climactic moment. Home. This playing with time is one of the many magical things in Nolan's movies. Many of them share the same <laughs> moment, where it all brilliantly clicks into place for the viewer. Amazing spectacle aside, Dunkirk delivers an important message about generosity and humility. The small boats are defenseless against German dive bombers. Selfish heroism is revealed as a Hollywood myth, narrow and weak against the wealth of companionship. In a way, maybe this was a love letter to the British people, their honor and their willingness to work together to achieve the extraordinary. Maybe the film has some hidden meaning about England's departure from the European Union. The feeling of Englishmen coming together, although Nolan has dismissed this as a modern interpretation of a past event. And surprisingly for a World War II movie, there are almost no Germans in it. Sure, we see some Nazi planes, plenty of Nazi bombs, but we don't see any Nazi soldiers until the very end, and they don't even talk. Nolan drops the binary conventions of the war genre. There are no traditional Hollywood heroes here, no superiority just soldiers making their way through the horrors of war. Only time will tell how Dunkirk holds up as a war movie, and in years to come, it may not be considered the greatest war movie of all time, but it may just be the most effective at delivering the message it wants to convey. The message being that there are no real heroes in war, only survivors. Well, we did it, survive. That's enough. This island, or a large part of it, was subjugated and starving. Then our empire, beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until, in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. Thank you so much for watching this video guys. If you enjoyed it and would like to see more videos like this one, be sure to hit that subscribe button. We upload new essays every Friday. Make sure to like the video as well and we'll see you next week.